Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. So I get to preach this morning. I have the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Uh, for those who did not know me, I'm Virginia, um, 21 years old. <laughs> in the Lord this December. I decided, you know, Lord, I don't live for myself anymore. I'm just celebrating the days and the years that I've been walking with you. So, so there you go. But anyways, I'm excited to talk about the end times. And, and I was praying to the Lord. I said, okay, what can I say about the end times? You know, like what, what is going on? And to me, uh, I've been uh, living in this country for, I don't know, more, 30 years. About 30 not 30. I'm not going to tell you because then you're going to add my years. And if you, if you add it, then I want you to come and say, Pastor, I think you're this blank age. And then you have to give me cash for the days, for the years that you have. So, so that's what I'm telling you. If you want to give me 21, just give me 21. I'll take them. No, just kidding. It was an idea that I had. My husband says, stop it. Uh, okay. So the Bible says in the end times that we need to be vigilant. Okay. So I've been here a long time, more than I was in my country. And I have seen so many, you know, you watch the news, but now the news, it's all about Trump and the Kardashians. So that's all we get to see, you know, all entertainment and the news is all about them. It's all about them. It's 24 seven. I'm like, and the more you hear it, it could be, it could be scary. I know because I was doing a study, I'm a nerd and I'm so I'm a Googler and like, so what are people thinking? Do you know what people are doing right now because they believe we're living in the end times? They're selling their homes. They're selling their homes and they're heading up for the mountains. Some people are heading down, heading to, to the desert. Uh, they are getting all this ammunition and guns. Believe me, I love guns. There's nothing wrong with it, but they're doing it because they're so afraid. I think I'll be good at shooting. Pew, 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 pew. But, uh, and they're taking all this food and they're like, I, I guess they're creating like foxholes and all that. And I was, well, praise the Lord. I said, you know, I'm Salvadorian. I, I've been in a few foxholes. I, I can live like that. But that's not the end times that we're talking about. The Bible doesn't say, you know, you go into hiding, you go into fear. No, the Bible says completely the opposite. And that's what I want to talk to you about. How are we, if Jesus will come today, are you prepared to go? Is he going to find us walking in in anger? Is he going to find us walking in unforgiveness? Is he going to find me gossiping? If he's going to find me slandering, is he going to find me doing my own thing, my own pleasure? Or is he going to find me doing his will? And if you read the New Testament, I believe they live such a holy life. A holy life doesn't mean like, oh my gosh, you have wings with the halo. No, it means that your life is set apart from sin and you consecrate it to God. That's what holy means. That's what he wants from us. And so uh, when I read the Bible and I start reading, uh, read the New Testament, I encourage you to read the word of God so you can find hope. Because if you don't know the word of God, you're going to be, you're going to be disillusioned. You're going to be afraid. You're going to do, you're going to live your life according to what you want and not according to what God wants. But when you read it, all of them talk about the, the, the coming of Jesus. They say, Jesus is coming soon. And I believe that they lived such a holy life, such a consecrated life, and such in godliness remains the character of Christ because they were in expectancy that he is coming. And I think now we're like, it's 2,000 years ago. We're like, oh, my gosh. Because when I used to read, I'm like, dear Jesus, he had just died, and they were already expecting him to come back. But see, that's not the way he wants us to live with great expectation that he's coming back for his people. He's coming back for us. He's coming for a church that is walking and it's advancing the kingdom of heaven and that we are not moved by darkness. We are not afraid of darkness, but we are actually the ones that bear the light and we, it's the light that exposes the darkness. So I want you to live today knowing 
knowing who we are, knowing what's the way, what is it that I need to be doing now that, hey, we hear about, it says when you start listening, Jesus said, when I start listening about rumors of words and all these famines and all these earthquakes, we have been hearing that forever. But now, lately, it's like three earthquakes in the same, two earthquakes in the same place, three earthquakes in the same month in the same country. When have we seen all those things that are taking place? But see, God doesn't want us to focus on like, oh my gosh, what are we going to do? It's like, no, what do I need to do to prepare? Because those are signs that he's coming soon. Peter does not suggest, because Peter said something, Peter does not suggest that believers will head and, and have with that, you know, mountain mentality, right? We're going to go to the mountains, we're going to save and we're going to save ourselves. That's not what he meant. And start, and I'm going to quickly, for time, 2 Peter 3, 11 and 12. This is what it says. This is what, what Peter said. And Peter wasn't talking to the world. Peter's talking to Christians, to believers like you and I. You know, sometimes we're so busy criticizing the world that we forget. How am I supposed to be living? How am I supposed to be walking? How should my behavior, my life, my life should be reflecting Jesus? So this is what he says, and I'm, I'm picking up in verse 11. But if you, if you read verse 10, it talks about when Jesus, when Jesus comes. It's talking about his coming, his return. It says, since all these things will be resolved. He's talking about the earth. Hey, you know, we know the earth is going to be passed away. It says, what manner of persons are you to be? What manner of a person, a daughter of God, a son of God, you ought to be now? And he says, be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God. You know, we're, we're upset that God doesn't come where you and I can haste it. What does that mean? Talk to us in English. It means that we get to, you and I can make it happen faster if we do our job. Our job on this earth is to advance the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is to occupy. Jesus says, occupy until I come. What does occupy, occupy mean? It means we are invading. Darkness should not be invading us. Fear should not be invading us. We need to make a choice and we say, no, I invade fear. I invade whatever the devil tries to throw at us. And believe me, he does try everything. In 21 years, I have experienced so many things. And I had the choice because it's the choice at the end of the day. What are we going to do when things hit you? Or when fear comes, or when tragedy comes, times are going to get harder, but I'm going to be stronger. And that's the way you have to see yourself. I'm going to be stronger. I'm not, not, I'm not going to be easily moved. I'm not going to be easily shaken. My job as a daughter of God, as a son of God, is to live in holiness, is to be separate. I cannot be confused like with the world. Let me ask you something. At work, do they know that you're a Christian? Not because of your huge Bible like this one. Because I need glasses. And you refuse to wear glasses so the bigger the Bible gets, right? And you're like, you feel great about it. Like it's, it's like 10 pounds Bible, right? And we open it to Psalms 91 so people can see. And then you have your little fishy. And for snacks, you only eat fish. <laughs> and then you play worship songs. But you're the meanest, the un so unkind, love to gossip. I'm not saying you, other people, of course. <laughs> but we think that that's a form of godliness. You know, you go to church, you can serve. We're not talking about that. I'm not talking about that time, that, 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 that kind of Jesus followers. Now, in these times that we're living Christianity, the word Christians means almost nothing. In the Bible, when he started calling them, uh, people used to mock 
followers of Jesus Christ. So that name came from not a, woo, you're a Christian. It came from a derogative uh, name that they used to say, oh, you're, you're like Christ. You mean you forgive like Christ? You have mercy like Christ? You lay hands on the sick and they recover? You even, Paul even resurrected a kid from the dead? You, you're, like, you're like little Christian. You're like Christ. So it became from not from a good place, from a bad place. Because they just looked like Jesus, acted like Jesus, walked like Jesus, spoke like Jesus, thought like Jesus. But now Christianity is like you said, so what do you do? Like, uh, you know, what kind of religion do you have a Christian? Oh, they don't even want to talk to us. Why? Because we're not reflecting. We're not reflecting who we need to be and who we really are in Jesus Christ because we're easily moved. I heard people say in pray, uh, can you agree with me in prayer? What's your prayer? You know, I'm, I'm in at this, at this job and the people are so worldly. Awesome. Amen. They're worldly? Oh, my gosh. You're, you're, you don't need to go to the mission field. There is your mission field. Yeah. And they're paying you to be in the mission field. Yeah. You don't need to fundraise. Oh, no, it's because it's, it's, it costs too much. And they, ah, so do you. Don't lie to me. Here and there, you say a little word here and there. Okay, am I talking? And you're like, no, no, that's not me. But no, that's the reality that we're living. That's the reality that we're living, that we have to say, hey, I'm a Christian. You know that we shouldn't even say I'm a Christian? The people should see by the way that we live our lives, they see that there is something different about you. Amen. I don't know what it is, but I want to be like you. I don't know why you're always happy when you should be crying. I don't know why you're always hopeful when there is no hope. And then you go around just speaking life and just believing the best and not gossiping and not partaking from what other people partake. Because you are consecrated, you're holy, you're set apart. And the Bible says, be holy as I am holy. Those are the end times. You want to know how to, how to walk in these last days? That's how we need to walk. That's what we need to do. Peter says, in the end times, Christians are called to do one thing, and that is to practice holiness. Do you know that we need to practice holiness? What does that mean, Pastor? It means that we practice it. It means that we practice. How do, how do I stay, how do I stay a set apart for my God? I remember working at this place years ago, many years ago in the school district, and I was shocked because we would all get, you know, when you have your break and you go and take your lunch, but everybody was like devouring one another. I sat there listening to like, they just talk about teacher so-and-so, when that teacher would come, hi, and then she would talk about so-and-so, and I was like, hi. I thought, what am I, oh God, I can't even come into this room. I'm not going to sit there. And I decided, I decided about myself, because I love God, I decided I'm not going to sit in that round table, because if I sit there and I just nod my head, I mean, agree with what they're saying. And that doesn't mean being set apart. So I will grab my Cheerios and my Dr. Pepper. <laughs> that was my snacks. Cheerios and Dr. Pepper. And they would think that I was the weirdest person in the world. And I would go, I'm going to go sit at the other place. Or I'm going to go for a walk and I'm going to pray. And no, like, hey, I'm going for a walk and I'm going to pray so you can see me. No, I'm just okay then. So nice seeing you. Adios. But no, but now we sit there and we just, we just breathe in, breathe in everything that they're saying to us. And I'm going to tell you, at some point in your life, you're going to change the way you view your coworkers. No, because they have done anything to you. It's because you sat there and you heard and you were silent. And silence is an action. Silent is agreement. This is a message of joy. So when my husband comes, comes back, you better tell me, I was so funny. She was so good. <laughs> yeah, you better do it. <laughs> no, <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> Jesus said that we, he says, we are supposed to work the works of God. This is what Jesus said. I want you to occupy. Works the works of God. Until I come back, I want you to be working, not just waiting. And oh, I'm just waiting for Jesus. No, he's waiting on you. He's waiting on you so we can win the world, so we can win the law, so we can give them hope. 
Paul seems to have the same thinking in Galatians 6, 12, 6 10. He says this, therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. He didn't say let us do good to some. He's talking to Christians. He's talking to believers. So that means be good to all. Especially, he says, especially those who are in the household of faith. How is it that we're not, that we are not, we don't have, we don't take the opportunity to be good to the people in the church? He says, be good to all, but especially to those of the faith. But sometimes it's easier to be good to other people, right? Because we have a great expectations with the people of faith. Hey, you shouldn't be, you know what you're wearing? Mm Mm-mm. Do you know how you talk about the people? Mm -mm. It says, be good. Not according to their goodness, but according to the goodness that is inside of you. Right? Right now, we are living in times when every church, if you, you, you go, you study, go and focus on the family, and they have all these stats, but they're calling the great exodus of believers because they're leaving churches. Because the church is, uh, you say, come to church. No, everybody, you know what? Everybody has been hurt in a church. Hey, I've I've been hurt in a church. Hey, you hurt me, as a matter of fact. No, just kidding. I want to wake you up. But all of us at some point in our lives have been hurt. Someone might have said something or you heard something. But that's not a reason to forsake each other. That's not a reason to forsake the church. Jesus says, the gates of hell should not prevail against my church. Yes, you are the church, but he loves when we come into agreement. He says, do not neglect assembling each other. Do not neglect it. But we neglect it. Ah, church. No, I want to be found if Jesus will come today. I'd rather him find me preaching. I want him to find me forgiving. I want him to find me me walking in mercy. I want him to find me me doing good and what pleases him. I don't want him to find me full of bitterness. I don't want him to find me full of hurt. I don't want him to find me talking about somebody else. No matter how much they have done, against me. I don't want to do that because I have to make a choice. He's coming soon and my job is to stay consecrated to him. My job is to do good no matter what people do to me. That's my job. It says be vigilant, but we're vigilant about what other people are doing. Have you noticed that? We're good. We're like the militia. You're like going around and checking how everybody's doing. No, you be vigilant about your own life. Even when we're married, we, spouses, women are good to be vigilant on our husbands. And like, you're doing this wrong. You should be reading more. You should be you know, praying more. You should be doing that. How come I, you do it for yourself. Believe me, because I was one of those wives. I think you need a little bit more, more war time. You need a little bit of more praying, a little bit more of the Holy Ghost. No, I need more of those things. Because we're busy trying to, to be vigilant about other people and we forget who we are and what we need to be doing. 2 Timothy 3, 1, 5, since I am doing good in time, I'm going to read it in, into, um, into translations. But the New King James is this, but now this. And this is Paul speaking. That is in the last days, in the last day, perilous times will come. Perilous means, you know what perilous means? It doesn't mean comfort, comforting times will come. It means trouble, huge trouble, a lot of pressure, a lot of problems, a lot of trials. It says, In the last day, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. He's not talking about the world again. He's not talking about the unsaved. He's talking about believers. He says they will be lovers of money, boasters. Boasters means empty pretenders in the Greek. Empty, you're pretending to be someone that you're not. Proud, you're arrogant. No one can speak into your life because you know it all. 
Oh, no, I know it. I know it. Then do it. Right? Blasphemers. You know what it means? It means speaking evil, slanderous, reproachful, disobedient to parents. Sometimes, because we're parents, we only read that part to our kids. Look what they said. But in the last time, the kids are going to be disobedient. But you don't read the other part, because you might be in the other part, right? <laughs> Look over here. Disobedient to, to parents. You're unthankful. No, no, no. You don't choose and pick what you want. We eat the word complete. This is disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. You know what unholy means? Wicked. I have called a few people wicked in their face, though. Not on Facebook, in their face. Yeah. Yeah, that's love to tell you, you know what? This is a little bit wicked. Because you know what it means? It means twisted. It's a twisted mentality, a twisted thinking. That's not how God thinks. You are wicked in this moment because you are off. And people say, oh my gosh, you called me wicked. And I'm on Facebook, right? No, I didn't say it. I didn't come up with this term. God did. Doesn't mean you go around to wicked, wicked, wicked. No, I'm talking that when people come to you and you know what? That's a little bit wicked. That's off. That's twisted. Unloving, unforgiving, slanders. You know the word slanders means gossipers? I, I, trans, I went into like some nerd for, for all the translations in the Greek and the Hebrew, and I love to chew it so I could really understand it. The word slanders means diabolos. I was like, diabolos, look. That's what it means. You know, that means devil. Devil, false accuser. We can partake of that. He says, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong. Have you ever met people that are headstrong? Dang, you can't speak nothing to them because they're like so set on their ways. They counsel themselves. You can never counsel them because they already counsel themselves and they will not be moved. Haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such people turn away. What is it that it didn't say from such uh, uh, church turn away? It says from people that are living like this, you are to turn away. But we're turning away from that church because you met that person at the church. No, no, no. It says, no, you stay away from people like that. Don't lend your ear. Don't, don't waste a moment when you see all this, like people that are just, and you will recognize, if you walk in the spirit of God, he gives us wisdom, he opens our understanding, and you will recognize, you know what, this is, this is twisted. This does not align with the word of God, so I have to stay away from this person. But now what people are doing, they're staying away from the church. I'm going to read it in the same uh, the same verse in the NCV, because I love how it says it, and it's more understandable for some people. Remember this, in the last days there will be many troubles, because people will love themselves, love money, brag, and be proud. They will say evil things against others, and they will, and they will not obey their parents, or be thankful, or be kind to people. They will not love others, will refuse to forgive. Do you know people that refuse to forgive? You're like, yeah, I'm one of them. In 21 years that I have been a Christian, there have been times in my life that I refuse to forgive. Can I, can I be honest? Yeah. Why? Because it, they hurt me. But we are like, no, we're, we're Christian. We're not supposed to say that we hurt. Oh, no, you hurt. I pinch you and it's going to hurt you. <laughs> right? It hurts when people do things that they should not be doing. It hurts us. We are all going to be hurt. If you're breathing, you will at some point experience some kind of hurt, some kind of betrayal, some kind of gossip, some kind of slander. You will experience that, but that doesn't mean that you allow that to change you. And it's so easy to allow pain to change us. So what do we do? We bring it to God. Because, because forgiveness is a process. It's 
How is that a process? Forgiveness is today. Today, faith is for today, not tomorrow. You can say, well, tomorrow I'm going to try to forgive this so-and-so. No, because tomorrow is not faith. Faith is today. So today you can say, you know what? I've, Heavenly Father, help me. I forgive this person. Then the next year you see them and you want to choke them, but you say it the same thing. You say like, <laughs> nope, nope. Am I being real or not? You're like, no, I never failed a pastor. Ah, uh, please. Oh, it hurts. You might not want to choke them, but you don't want to see them. They, they change when you see them. It changes even how you feel inside. So that means they have power over you. So why do you say the next day? Thank you, Father God. I forgive them yesterday. And today I forgive them again. 70 times 7. Forgive them again. And you see them in three minutes and you still feel the same. I forgive them. And you continue to do un until your feelings and your hurt, it's transformed in the process. All of a sudden, you're going to feel like, you know, it has become my reality. And you learn how to forgive and how to not hold grudges for a long time. For years, maybe the first will be months. And then the more you do it, the more you exercise holiness, the faster it is to become a forgiving person. It says, stay away from people that gossip and will not control themselves. They will be cruel. They, they will hate what is good, will turn against their friends. Have you seen people turn against their friends? You're like, what? You can't even believe it. That's my friend. No, they wouldn't say that. Well, it says, no, you will have people that will turn away your own friends, and you still have to forgive. And it says, and will do foolish things without thinking. They will be conceited, will love pressure, pleasure instead of, instead of God, will act, will act as if they serve God, but will not have his power. Stay away from such people. Stay away from such people. Do not let yourself be contaminated, be polluted because of the way they live and what they say and what they speak. Do you know that speaking against one another, you're speaking against God? God is never going to agree with me if I come to him and, and, and I'm complaining about so-and-so. He's never going to say, Virginia, you're right. Oh, right, come on, baby. Come sit here, baby. Let's talk bad about so-and-so. Oh, they were so mean. No, because you know what? He sees us through the blood of Christ. You and I have the opportunity. You and I, when we come to the Lord, have the opportunity at any time, at any time. You and I, when we miss it, he says that we have the access to the throne of grace. In that moment, we just go in and we come and we come without shame. That boldness means shamelessness. And you know when you go before God, right, and the enemy is already talking in your head, it's like, how is God going to forgive you? You've been so unforgiving. He goes through the list because he keeps track. He tallies our sins. God doesn't tally our sins. God wipes away our sin when we come to him. So we have to go, and then the, the enemy is going to tell you, no, he's not going to forgive you. He's not going to help you. You were, you were disobedient. I, he spoke to you. You didn't listen to him. You don't deserve it. And that's the moment that you say, that's the only moment that you can have a conversation with the devil. Say, you're right. I don't deserve it. I don't. I really don't. And I know I don't deserve it, but, but my father sees me through the blood of Jesus. And that's why I have forgiveness in Christ. That's what I can come with boldness and not with shame. And I can get my life right today, not tomorrow. And I don't have to go into five prayers, 25 chapters. You know, in Mexico, they have this thing that, that um, they, uh, you know, just to be forgiven. Um, they come from, let's say they come from Oaxaca, which is like super far. And they come to the city and they're all walking not even walking, they're on their knees. I'm gonna, I'm gonna dirty my, my, my white pants, but look. But that's how they go. Without anything, they're gonna do that for days to arrive to the church so the virgin can forgive them. We don't have to even crawl from, from the liquor store to this church for God to forgive you. It takes just 
one word, two words, God, forgive me. And he forgives us. He's not going to ask you, nope, this is what you need to do, A, B, C, D. No, no, no. He's just going to say, okay, then, son, daughter, we can start. We can start again. And God will never give us more than we can handle because in the last times, in the last day, there was be, there's going to be such, such uh, suffering. It's going to be a lot of pressure. The same verse that I was reading, jumping to verse 11 and 13, says, you know, this is Paul. He says, you know that I have been hurt and I have suffered. See, that's why I love Paul. He says, you know that I've been hurt. He's not pretending that he didn't get hurt and that he has suffered. He says, as in Antioch, Iconian, and Lystra, I have suffered. But the Lord saved me from all those troubles. Everyone who wants to live as God desires in Christ will be persecuted. In other words, you will suffer. If you want to live like Christ, people are going to talk crap about you. Yeah, it's not a bad word. Because that's what they talk. They talk lies. They, they're going to slander you. But it says, if you're going to live like him, just expect it. Expect it. But people who are evil and cheat others will go from bad to worse. They will, they will fool themselves, but they will also be fooling themselves. In my last scripture, James 1.12 says, Blessed them, it blesses the man who endures temptation. Do you know the word temptation is not just about you being tempted to commit adultery, you being tempted to be moral, you being tempted to uh, watch porn. Are those temptations? Yes. But what he's talking about, it, when I study the word, it means, and I'm going to read it in the NIRV, it says, blesses the person who keeps on going when times are hard. That's the temptation. The temptation is to quit. The temptation is that you want to do what you want to do when that comes. He says, after they have come through hard times, this person will receive the crown, the crown of its life itself. The Lord has promised to those who love him. To endure temptation, and the word temptation means a process. It means to remain, to suffer, to persevere under misfortunes and trials, to hold fast to one's faith in Christ. Bear bravely and calmly. Who wants to bear bravely and calmly? Our jobs as children of God in the end time is to allow God to, to mold us, to shape us. This is a, a vase that I brought from, from Oaxaca. It's really cute, isn't it? I'm like, I want God to, to shape me and to mold me, but I, don't, I want him to do like, bling, in Jesus' name, and I'm voila. Like, oh. What a piece, I'm not gonna say, what a wonderful piece of art. Okay, but this didn't, this was just a lump of clay that someone saw potential. And they just have it there, it looks like dirt, it looks like nothing. And I saw the, 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 the person who was, who was molding the, the vase, the potter, and then they were, they, it was a lot of pressure. To create this, there's a lot of pressure and heat. And, and they're doing it, like I thought to myself when I watched it, it's like doing it in times of Jesus. They don't have the wheel, like, you know, and you go faster. The process is faster. Actually, the process in the times of Jesus, even when he talks about the, the potter, it was a long process. I couldn't even watch. It was an hour and they still were not done. I was like, oh my gosh, who wants to watch an hour of pottery being made? But see, that's what happens to us. Who wants to go through the process of God developing my character? And first, there is so much pressure they, because it's just hard. It's so hard. And that's the way we come to God. We're so hard. So they had to put a lot of water, but they have to pound it. They were not kneading it like bread. No, they were pounding that thing. I was like, I, it hurts me because I'm like, that's what it means when I'm being molded. Sometimes we, we have the urge to quit in the, in the midst of us being processed, of us being made just like Jesus. And after that, then they put it in this old thing. It's even a plate. It's a plate and another plate like the opposite. And they're themselves doing it. My God, that takes forever. I'm like, Can you get a wheel, please. You know, can, can we become like microwave now? Like, 
Or can you just mold it, mold it, get a mold and just, you know, wet the clay and just put it there and then voila, it's done, put it in the fire. And no, it takes forever. That's why they don't do it because it's original. This thing took like, I think a half a day and I'm like, oh my gosh. So what, I'm, what am I saying to you that do not, you have to fight the urge to quit you, fight, you have to fight the urge to, to align yourself with your own opinion. Do not counsel your own self. Allow God to mold you. Yes, it's a painful process, but it's doable. And so once the lady put it all together and it looked cute, this is not one of the best, right? Because I couldn't have money to buy the beautiful ones. But, but after she was done, I was like, oh, praise God, they're going to put it in the sun. It's going to dry no, 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 that's, it, go, it goes in the, in the oven, the furnace, to go into this heat. And I'm like, no, no heat. You already pounded me. You already molded me. I, I, you already put me on a spin cycle. I didn't know when I was up and when I was down. And now you're going to put me in the fire? Yes, he's going to put me through the fire so my faith is refined and your faith is refined and we won't crack. And that's what we need to do. So if you're taking anything today, is that what does God want me to do in the end times? He wants us to advance his kingdom. He wants us to be set apart. He says, exercise holiness and godliness. And that's what we need to do. Set apart for him. That we don't look like the world. We don't look like other people. Like I just mentioned. And those are Christians. No, that you will never be partake of those things. Because they will contaminate you. If today's message impacted you in any way. And you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift. Text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.